Island Records and Chris, Chris Blackwell. I mean, you know, even talking to you now, I, mean, I don't know, Tony's probably thinking the same thing as me. We got a, we got a two-parter here for sure, yeah. I think. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, Island Records, I always, I, I worked in the radio industry for a, for quite a long time. And I don't know, I, I don't, it was kind of different then with labels as well. You know, they, they were kind of labels had more of an identity then. In fact, they were more independent uh, labels then. But I always liked Ireland, one of, the, one of the labels that I quite like. And I, I like the kind of eclecticism of, of, yes. of the label. And yes. I guess a lot of that is reflected in Chris Blackwell and his quite sort of idiosyncratic um, personality and, and, and approach to signing artists, would you say, Richard? There were very few bands or artists that got signed to the label that Chris didn't like. Mm. They all reflected his particular styles of music. Uh, and if he wasn't sure, he would trust the ears of his main A&R guy at the time, which was Muff Winwood. So Muff brought the Southern Brothers and Muff brought Sparks to the table. Uh, Wow, you know, then then you had Chris's back in, back in. It was a. I always liken it to to having studio carte blanche. Chris would, uh, as a as a young up and coming engineer, he he encouraged the, all us young engineers to dive in the deep end. He would almost literally give us the keys to one of the two studios that were at Basing Street. Give us the keys to the studio. Digby, this is John Martin. John Martin, this is Digby. You guys go in there and don't come out till you've done a, till you've got a thirty minutes worth of music or forty minutes worth of music, and that mm. would, would be how it was, album after album after album, and uh, and it was uh, Chris's uh, unflinching confidence in both the artists and us as young engineers. I say us because I wasn't the only one there. You know, I, I list all, many of the other engineers who, who some of whom got, have gone on to do uh, great things themselves. Tony Platt, uh, Bob Potter, uh, Brian Humphreys, Frank Owen, um, Clyde Franks. They're all in, in, mentioned in the book. Uh, so Chris was generous to, to a fault and um, uh, was, was uh, a visionary. I think it's not too... Uh, incorrect to label him as such, although I could see Chris now flinching with a bit of embarrassment if, if he was present in, in, this, uh, in this discussion, because again, uh, a, a quite modest, I wouldn't say shy, but somewhat retiring chap, walked around the office all day in his Bermuda shorts and flip flops and then the, you'd get visiting record company executives, guys from Warner Brothers and flown over from the States to Nick, mm. from A&M Records. I remember one time there was all, all these American executives talking about Cat Stevens. Oh, yeah. Because Cat Stevens was, as were many of the island artists, yeah. were licensed to other labels in the States, to A&M and to Capital and Shelter and all, all yeah. kinds of that. So there's, you've got these, these crew-cutted American executive tycoons from from a and uh sitting at the round table in chris's office with chris you know stomping around in, in bermuda shorts and flip-flops and, and and with a encyclopedic recollection of of, of the, the deal that w had been made or was going to be made and would just usually have a couple of his, maybe an accountant, somebody like John Leffley would be sitting present, and maybe Tom Hayes, who was head of the international. Uh, and Chris never had any notes, never had any, you know, reference to anything. He, he would just, he was just so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that kind of coolness is, um, I don't know, he's part, part Jamaican. Is that right? Yeah. He is. So, he's so, born, born in England, raised in yeah. Jamaica. So, um, and you talk in the book about the fact, which was I thought was lovely, when you said about you, you went to the kind of West Indian cafes nearby, you know, and you know it was like it was your your port of call, and you felt kind of part of that community, I suppose, by association with Chris being sort of from yes. that part of the world, sort of thing. All us engineers and the, all the staff, office staff, and the musicians who worked at Basing Street Studios just off mm. the Bella Road in in that wonderful West London of uh, of the nineteen seventies. Um, 
there was a, a Jamaican, I was going to say notorious Jamaican restaurant, and that's probably the right way to describe it, the Mangrove on All Saints Road. And uh, yeah. we used to, uh, and it was, I wouldn't say it was a police no-go area, but it was as close to, uh, and, uh, but we used to get takeaway food from there. We used to go and sit in there and eat. And because we were associated with the coolest, hippest record label on the planet, who had Toots and the Maytels, Aswad, Jimmy Cliff, and later Bob Marley and then these beloved whalers, we were, we were um, encouraged, um, let alone allowed to go in. So it, it became almost like a second home to us, the Mangrove restaurant. Yeah, sounds nice. As uh, you know, bef before before the the age of terms such as multiculturalism and uh, and diversity, we we were multicultural and diverse and didn't even know we were. So yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful being in the studio with with uh, long haired white English rock and rollers like Spooky Tooth or Mot the Hoople, and then the next day being in in the same control room listening to a slightly different kind of music with a bunch of guys with dreads and yes. uh, and and rollins rolling reefers out of a tesco carrier bag full of yes yeah. just, to us it was it was just this part of the same process you know you 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 yeah. you're recording music and that yeah and, it was interesting in the in the chapter I read last night, which is the way we were talking about Johnny Nash, we were talking about Jimmy Cliff, we were talking about Bob Marley, who we'll come on to in a second. And I I love that 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 story because you said, you know, you think if you think about I suppose I'll, I'll put a different spin on it, but if you think about young kids on on the street corner these days, smoking some skunk or whatever, you know, and they're kind of off their heads and they're in their pain in the ass, you know. But when you're talking about th those guys, they were cool, you know, they were just like mellow and it was a lovely vibe and you know. It's just a different kind of thing altogether and, and also very professional and getting on with their job, you know. I describe in the book uh, exactly that uh, that state of affairs mm. Steve, with uh, the idea wasn't to drop out, it was to join in. Yes. It wasn't to, to, uh, to uh, get out of it, it was to get into it. It was uh, it, it, quite the opposite and... Um, and you, the the other thing we're working with the Rasta guys, bless them, was the, the complete absence of alcohol. So yeah, of course, there'd yeah. be no uh, there'd be no near near punch ups or you know yeah, heated, yeah. heated debates, shall we say, uh, in the, in the wee hours of the morning. You know, normally with a with a bottle of Jack Daniels in the yeah. bar. No spillage on the desk. Yes, that's right. No razor blades. Yeah, being used for other other utilitarian purposes no it was a and plus also and you could probably do a whole program on this Steve mm. um, and Tony's views on this is um, but uh, the the rich tapestry uh, the, the, the broad menu of different types of if we're talking about marijuana specifically mm. that were available it was a, a smorgasbord of, uh, of delight um, either you'll edit this out or it'll, 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 no, it's fine. It'll, it'll emerge somewhere on the internet. Yeah. Things like you talk about skunk today when I, when somebody drives past the car and it stinks and use it and it's just, and I have, uh, it's been a long time guys since I indulged in it. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything remotely wicked. It's, mm. it's beer, wine and whiskey and the odd cigarette now but that, so I lead a very quiet life, but back in the day, I was as busy as anybody in experimenting my uh, inner self. Yeah. And uh, I've tried that skunk, and it, it's the nearest thing to, to just being dangerously hallucinogenic. It's not pleasant. Yeah. It's unpleasant. Absolutely. Apparently, it's not pleasant. Apparently, well, I can tell you, it is. It isn't. It's it's uh, it's nothing remotely like the kind of uh, pleasure rush you would get from smoking. For instance, red Lebanese, yeah, or, Balkan, or Thai sticks. Since a million. Yeah, since a million. Yes, exactly. So you had to treat that stuff with respect. And I confess here and now on, on, on this station that I'm, uh, it, it never really agreed with me too much. Mm. Mm. The 
marijuana. Uh, yeah. I preferred the alcohol. I preferred taking a break and going up the pub and having a couple of pints. We, yeah. we, I, the, the longest session I ever did, just for the record, and I mentioned this in detail in the book, uh, was with John Martin and Danny Thompson. We, uh, we, we spent 60 something uninterrupted hours in the studio. Started on a Friday and they wheeled me out Monday lunchtime. And I mean, it was, uh, <laughs> but it was chemically assisted. <laughs> said. And I go into great detail in the book about it. Wow. That. Okay. Well, I look forward but, to reading that one. But talking about popping out on a break to go and have a pint and then coming back to the studio and being rejuvenated with a couple of pints of ale in you and then you could get stuck in. Um, we, although those sessions I recall with John and Danny were 60 plus hours, we did spend about 37 hours in the pub. So, fair enough, fair enough. So, it was only actually about 20 odd hours of work. Yeah, mathematically the right balance, I, I, I would say. Um, Bob Marley, you know, so you, you talk about in the book when you first met him, I forget who introduced you to... John, uh, Johnny Nash. It was Johnny Nash, yeah. Was. And he was just a young lad then, and you immediately liked him, and you thought there was a warmth to him, So, and then you went on to work with him. So what are, what are your kind of recollections of Bob Marley? Uh, I'm thinking of those smoky control rooms now with uh, all the raster guys, and not being able to, you couldn't actually count how many people were in the room sometimes. Like I yeah. joked with Tony Platt, a uh, fellow island engineer. Tony must be sent did a lot more work uh, with the whalers than I did. I think it was perhaps because of uh, the the culture that, the, as, I, as I've said, chemically, I don't think I didn't agree with me as much as the alcohol. So I think Chris Blackwood probably noticed that and pushed me more in the direction of the. Uh, of the white alcoholic rockers, <laughs> as opposed to the laid back marijuana smoking rustlers, you know. Although I, uh, I derived as much pleasure from working with both groups. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was working on uh, with a keyboard player called John Rabbit Bundrick, whom some may know of. Yeah. Uh, his history of working with Free and later with The Who for quite a number of years as the keyboard player in The Who. Um, Rabbit's still around, I keep in touch with him. He lives in Somerset, leading a very quiet life with his, uh, with his apples and his cats. Uh, but we were working, Rabbit introduced me to Johnny Nash and Johnny Nash booked the island Basing Street Studios to do the majority, if not all, of the keyboard overdubs on his album, uh, which featured, uh, God, you're going to have to help me here, Steve, uh, more questions than answers. Um, he, he did a version of Steer It Up that I think Johnny co wrote with, with Marley. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Johnny Nash, and I can see clearly now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More questions than answers. It was that time in Johnny Nash's career and yeah. Rabbit provided all the keyboard overdubs on those sessions. Mm. Uh, there would be Johnny, Johnny's manager, Danny Sims, and Rabbit. Who you told another story about in the book, which we'll leave for the readers to enjoy their own. About Danny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, very, a very exciting man, Danny. <laughs> yes. yes. It's worth the wait, isn't it? <laughs> yes, so, yes. And Johnny. And Rabbit with his moo and uh, and early uh, early arc synthesizers and and electric pianos, clavinets, all kinds of stuff. You know, yeah. probably pre MIDI. If uh, for those of of a technical persuasion, I believe it would be MIDI. So it would have been Rabbit playing all this stuff yeah. live. So yeah. if there was a mistake made, you'd have to wind the tape back, drop in, fix yeah. the mistake listen back, all that sort of stuff. So th that went on for a number of weeks, uh, probably over a period of a couple of months, not every day, but so getting to know Johnny and his manager, Danny, and again, delightful, uh, delightfully charming man, Johnny Nash uh, is. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, again, another, another readily, easily identifiable vocal style. Yes, very much so. So, uh, so, so an engineer's dream, really, you just put a microphone in front of these people yeah. and you just lift. People say, oh, how did you get that great vocal sound on, on such and such a record? He said, well, you, you, you put a microphone in front of somebody and you lift the fader up and you hit record. That's how you do it. You know? <laughs> uh, 
glad to see that. Yeah. So if it sounds like, if it sounds that good, it's usually because it is at source. So Johnny uh, brought, had met and worked with Bob Marley back in Jamaica. And I believe Danny Sims was actually, could be credited as being the first person to discover Bob Marley and, and Bob mm. Marley was signed to Danny Sims management company. And then one late morning in Studio Two, the smaller of the two studios of Basing Street, on a Johnny Nash session with me, Rabbit, and Danny, Johnny came into the control room and said, I'd like to introduce you to this friend of mine. He's a reggae singer. This is Bob. Bob, this is Dickie. You know, nice to meet you and everything. And yeah, uh, a, a warmth. You know it yourself. The, 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 there is that song that says seven seconds, isn't it? That within seven seconds, you can identify it or not with a fellow human being. I think it's yeah. less than seven seconds. Yeah. I have the theory that it's probably not much more than one or two seconds. Um, and I felt that, that, that instantly with, with Mr. Mark Marley. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could talk all day about Bob Marley, really. Yeah. But, uh, wow. You know, just a phenomenon, just a, literally a phenomenon. I, I, I will say this, but this is to make it as brief as possible. Years ago, one of my favorite ever lecturers when I was doing a, a, a degree was a guy called Glenn Jordan. Now, he's, he's, uh, in, uh, um, he's related to Michael Jordan, you know, the big tall, okay. uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and so his thing was kind of, you know, he said about multiculturalism, he was, talk, was talking about ethnicity and musical cultures and this, that, and the other. So one day we were talking about Bob Marley, he's played a whole bunch of Bob Marley, bearing in mind this is in South Wales now, yeah? Mm -hmm. So he then, he then says to, you know, he plays the Bob Marley, so he says, when Bob Marley died, I can't remember how many thousand, it was absolutely ludicrous, it was like miles long procession behind his, behind his, uh, his coffin. So he said, oh, um, so, you know, so what, why do you think that was? And so, you know, everyone's like fumbling around, you know, pretending they didn't hear him, just didn't have to answer. And one lad puts his, puts his hand up and he says, oh yeah, so what do you think? He's quite popular. <laughs> 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 this is the yeah. best answer ever. I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> yes, uh, wonderfully Welsh, I love it. Honest, direct and to the point. Yeah. <laughs> I think Glenn was laughing so much as sweat was running down his face, but it was, it was fun. Um, talking about fun things, Morris the Cat. Morris the Cat. Now, I could list all the albums uh, that came out of Ireland Basing Street Studios, uh, and there, would, there wouldn't be one record that would escape the, uh, the scrutiny of, of the ears of Morris the Cat. If you were, forgive me mixing a metaphor, barking up the wrong tree with a <laughs> song, uh, <laughs> Morris the studio cat who very sat on the on the carpeted area at the, at, along the top of the desk there was a, it was a soft cut. Morris the Cat would sit there right in front of the big tannoy speakers at, at the hooligan level <laughs> so his little ears twitching away with every snare drum beat and his cheeks pulsating with every bass drum beat. And if, you, if the mix wasn't sounding right, for whatever reason, you just couldn't get, you know, you know it's like telling you when you're in a studio and you're working on a track, you've been working on it so long you kind of lost the plot. The best thing you can probably do is just pull all the faders down and start again, you know. So you're at this point with a mix and it's just not happening. And you, confirmation of the fact that the mix was not correct would be the sight of Morris, the studio cat, jumping down off the top of the desk and exiting the control room. <laughs> at which point you would all just look at each other and go, well, start again, pull the faders down, take all the EQ, all the reverb off, all the effects, just yeah. start again and build the track back up and start with the drums, get the drums and the bass, get the track working, and then you think, ah, it's sounding better now. Yeah, get, getting back on top of it. In would come Morris, jump back up onto the desk, and you'd think, hit record, quick, capture the mix while it's while it's sounding good. Mm. I, I say in the book, I refer to Morris the Cat's pause on approach to A and R. <laughs> like it, yeah. Also, I tell you what else I like. I, I, I like about the book is um, the drawings. 
So Morris oh. the Count gets a, gets a place of honor, obviously, towards the end of the chapter. And you make a reference in a chapter, and then, like in the next one, then it's, it's the daffodils. You know, it's kind of nice how that's done. Who, who did the drawings for you? The illustrations were done by Laura Corwood. Okay. Mel W O D. She's a she does illustrations for children's books. I was introduced to her by her husband, Martin Corwood, who is a fabulous guitar player. Tony, you should check him out. Yeah, well, definitely. He, he plays with, uh, or he was when I when I first met him and got to work with him, uh, playing with a local uh, reggae band down here in the southwest called Lion Star, and uh, Martin Colwood is uh, superb as is his wife uh, a superb illustrator yeah and the lovely drawings i saw some of her work and the uh, once i got a publisher interested in in mm. the book they did inquire you must have a bunch of photographs and you think back over i was thinking that too well there ain't none okay there's hardly any yeah. and there's a couple of me on the pitch playing football with rod and there's maybe yeah. one or two uh, but there's nothing of me with the Zep boys, not, nothing of me with Paul McCartney and Linda, who I mentioned in the book. Uh, we, we, um, so I saw Laura, an example of Laura's work, and I thought of the Baker-like poem in the yeah. first chapter. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought, uh, so I said to Laura, you can draw me a picture of an old Baker, have a look online, what, what the old Baker-like phones used to look like. That weigh half a ton and you've got a sort of about six inches of curly wire on them, you know. So, yeah. uh, so she sent me that, and I thought, that's it. I'll put a picture of something that's mentioned in each chapter at mm. the end as a yeah. reminder before. I mean, that's oh, one of the. Sorry, yeah, I'm glad you, you you like the illustration. No, yeah, no. I just sorry, didn't want to talk across. Just as, just as to compliment you actually, and to reassure you that as one of your readers, it totally works. Oh, good. Very pleased to hear that. I shall pass that on to Laura. She's she's very busy. She's doing a lot of uh, yeah. illustrations in, in children's books. No, it's great. I, I, I really like that. Um, and I like cats. Well, there we go. I only mentioned Puss Puss earlier, so it's a, we want a bit of a roll with cats, really. Uh, yes. Now, I was I was going to... I'm not going to do this now, because I think, I think I'll let people read about this, but I'll, I'll point people towards the Junkyard Angels early morning uh, pl uh, plod visit because that, that, that's that's certainly a, a great story we, we alluded to that territory earlier yes but um uh could you possibly i don't know whether you can from where you are uh, how many records are on the wall behind you uh i've got 13 wow um, okay um, gold so, and silver records from over the years there's nine so, of them there did you want to mention is there anyone we haven't mentioned do you wanted to quickly kind of just quickly <laughs> Mentioned, well, I mean, there's there's prefab spread, yeah, heartbreaker from free, uh, voice of the beehive, Jimmy Cliff, the harder they come, sparks, this town ain't big enough, uh, Jim Capaldi, shortcut draw blood. I, I was on a good roll for a number of years, I've got them from the 70s, I've got a couple from the 80s, I've got uh, prefab sprout and another one from the 90s. And then in the in going into the new millennium, I was working. I'd been to Japan, and I had a couple of gold records with a band in Jan in uh, in Japan in two thousand and something. But uh, my my record of, re of, of of presentation discs mm. has uh, of, of having at least one, sometimes a couple for each decade, has sadly come to an end. Because I ain't, I ain't had a big hit since 2010. Oh, well, you got to work harder, you know. I know. I'm getting getting lax, lax in my in my youth. Um, just wanted to talk to you about a, a couple more things. Cause it's been absolutely fantastic uh, talking mm. to you. Actually, it's, you know, um, you. Tony and I, you know, can say, you know, you see a picture of Bowie behind him, and you know, I'm surrounded by guitars. You, you just you talk in our language, and it, oh, nice. it's, it's great. I just wanted to ask you um, about kind of, we talked about it a little bit from a different perspective. We talked about kind of beautiful mistakes, I suppose. Um, but n nightmare scenarios, things that go wrong in the studios, got any, got any kind of good ones on that? Uh, apart from the, uh, the episode of the, the torn tape on, <coughs> on the Bill Halverson session, 
Uh, things have gone catastrophically wrong. Maybe sometime you've forgotten to hit record or something like that. I don't know. Oh, yes. Uh, I remember one time hitting record when I shouldn't have done. Right. I, and I raced some of Simon Kirk's drums on the end of a, of a free track. The, the, with, uh, and I can't to this day remember what song it was because I must have. I must have made a conscious effort to delete it from my from my memory. There was a an occasion when, uh, yeah, without getting too technical, but the patch bay was in, in the studio. Modern engineers might not know what a patch bay is, but it was a way of diverting, controlling signal path. And uh, the idea was to record uh, uh, Four of the all four of the guys in free playing a tambourine each. Oh yeah. We set up uh, four microphones in the, in the studio. We had them all in the set. It was going to be it was going to be stereo tambourines on a, on, a, on a spectre scale, you know, on a Phil Spectre like scale. And we spent about half an hour setting this up, checking all the microphones, getting the level, running through it a couple of times, uh, and instead of recording it on two blank tracks for argument's sake, might have been tracks 15 and 16. The only way you could get a stereo output from that particular configuration was to come out of groups one, two, plug that into 15 and 16 input. But instead of putting tracks 15 and 16 into record, I armed on the tape machine. This is going to go over a lot of... That's you know, all right, we'll with you. You guys might forget yeah. that. Uh, uh, I put tracks one and two armed, mm. ready to go into record. Now you're talking in the days of non, no such thing as non-destructive editing. If you erase something, it has gone. Yeah. You aren't going to find it looking under the desk or behind a screen. Or if mm. if, it, if you erase it, it's gone. So be sure. Uh, and it came to the point in the song where the with the Phil Spector tambourine quartet is going to make its grand entrance and I hit record and the drums disappeared mm -hmm. and uh, I think I hold the uh, possibly the world record for hitting a stop machine on a tape machine uh, yeah. in the fastest time mm -hmm. it was a, a second at, at the most I hit record and I knew it and I hit stop but of course I erased about a second second and a half of Simon Kirk's drums and everybody was standing in the control room. They were all looking up at me. They were out in the live room. They're looking through the glass into the control room. Everything all right, Digby? And I'm sitting there with sweat. But see my life flash before me, because I know Simon is probably going to kill me. Yes. Because it's taken two days to get this back in track. Oh, man. I've just erased the big bit where the, where the big drum fill is and the, and the, and the, oh. the, the outro of the song starts, you know. And... Um, I said no, and I th sometimes, uh, and you guys will know this. You'll know this, Tony. Sometimes, when you, whether it's when you're playing or whether you're in the studio or whatever occupation you may be indulging in, the occasional mistake you can sometimes waffle your way around it by blaming the equipment or sort of coming up with some sort of, you know, inexplicable uh, reason why it happened. But this was just glaringly obvious that I had erased the drums and there was nobody else in the control room. Yeah. I had to confess my sins. So I pressed the talk back button and I said to Simon, I just I went gulp. I said, Simon, could you come into the control room for a minute, please? And Simon marched up and he's a big lad, Simon. <laughs> and he, he's uh, and he's got arms like a drummer, you know, he's, he's, yeah. he's a, and he came marching up the steps and walked into the control room. He said, What's, what's happened, Big Big? And I thought, well, it's, it's, it's just time to confess. And I said, Simon, I've erased your drums. And Simon Kirk, to his credit, and I'll yeah. never forget this, he could see how upset I was and frightened. Yeah. Uh, Simon said, are the drum mics still set up? And I looked at the desk and I could see that all the drum faders were still exactly where they'd be. He said, I'll redo them. He said, just drop me in at that same point. He said, I, was, I wasn't very happy with the drumming at the end anyway. Oh, wow. And I'm like, 
in disbelief and it, Simon goes out on the drums and I get to the point two, three, four, and I drop in to record and Simon joins in and plays all the way to the end of the song. Stop, we come in and we listen to it. It's a good drop in, it works. I drop in somewhere in between the bass drum and the snare. Boom, boom, gah, you know, just get in that gap, you know. And I drop in and Simon plays it back. He said, oh, that's better, I'll prefer that. And he just put his arm around me. He said, don't worry, Dick. He said, we all make mistakes. Wow. So we go. How nice was that? Brilliant. How nice was that? Yeah. And I live to I live to fight another day. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, well, yeah, that's a great story again. Um, that one's but, not in the book. See, yeah, the, they've got a freebie there. That's in the next book. It's in the next yeah, book. Yeah. A pr promo for the next book. Um, just just a couple of questions to end. By the way, just just for pure comedy value, which really should, is dark comedy, really. I've noticed that I should be in quite an important meeting now in work. As a reminder, I came up, but it started at twelve. So okay. I just say I, I just say I was interviewing you, and it's your fault. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely no problem. <laughs> yeah. I'll deal with that one later. Um, what would your advice be for? Um, I, I'm working in a university. We, we've got a music course. We've got a lot of guys there. They want to get into production. They want to be producers. Yeah. What would your advice be for sort of people wanting to get into the game these days? uh it's it, it's tough it's tough to to break into any of the uh into any of the media markets isn't it these days uh but rest assured it it, it wasn't exactly easy when i got got worked my way into the, into the business you, you'd sometimes just have to kind of get get that foot in the door and, and make a bit of a push and mm -hmm. and uh, and make a bit of noise and uh and there's a lot of luck involved, just being in the right place at the right time. You know, it's not every day you, you, you meet a Chris Blackwell, but you will. There will be, there are Chris Blackwells out there. Uh, give people the benefit of the, of the doubt. Uh, be likeable and, and be generous with your time. Uh, and you'd be surprised what will come back to you. I'm yeah. a big fan in, in, in that sort of spiritual uh way of, of approaching life um if it's music is your is is your specific destination be absolutely sure that you are 100 percent obsessed with music and with listening to music and, and loving music and and all as many different types of music as possible uh don't just narrow yourself down to one genre you know widen your horizons uh travel listen to as much music from as many different sources as possible be tenacious um take the rough with the smooth take uh what's the rudyard kipling poem if uh, treat to uh, success and failure as the imposters they both are uh you know and uh and enjoy life Brilliant, brilliant advice. And knock on door number 38, if it comes along. Yeah, there's always one that isn't on your list, you know what I mean? There's, there's always a surprise lurking. And it, the kid, what I've learned most, uh, Steve, Tony, and your listeners, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a would have, could have, should have type of person. I always believe that you make, you, you make the decisions you make at the time based on the circumstances that existed at that time. It's a completely fruitless exercise to look back and say, oh, well, I should have done this because you were in a different, you were in a different bubble then. You had a whole different set of circumstances. Yeah. So, but I would pay more attention. The, your breaks can come from the, the, the strangest of places. I can think, I can look back, and this isn't a would have, could have, should have regret. It's just a statement of fact. Uh, as I've gotten older and I've analysed my own, and I've got, I've got to know myself better. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd known myself as well then as I do now. Yeah. And I, 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 the Stones did that, didn't they? That's right. Yeah. Uh, which way? With, with that song. With that song i wish i was it the stones i wish i knew them what i know now it's not the stones who was it okay the research come back to me mcginnis flint is it mcginnis flint might be yeah we're going to look that up lovely so, yeah. yeah i i can look back and just as a statement of fact that there were times when people i was working with 
would, would, for example, introduce me to somebody. And I'd go, oh, hi, nice to meet you. You know, being the sort of naive, green, yeah. innocent person I was in, the, in those days. I mean, I still am to a large extent, but I don't, I, you think, it, I look back now and think, should have cultivated that uh, connection, that introduction. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that person, you, you know, could have let, so it's, I, sh I use the could have word. I don't mean to use that. It's, it's just, I, so my advice to you, to your students is, mm. is, is be attentive, be focused, keep, keep both eyes and both ears open all the time because opportunity uh, can come, it can strike from out of nowhere and before you know it, it's coming, it's gone. So just, just to close off, because what, I'm just hearing what you're saying, advice for the students, I think advice for one of the lecturers is probably a good idea to try and get to the tail end of the meeting. But I'll just put the book up there one more time, because what I liked about what you did there was um, you used the word bubble, which kind of brought us into the, into the current thing as well, which was, which was which a nice connection. How's that um, working for you guys? Um, pardon? Has mm -hmm. the, this... I'll well, thing working for you, for you yeah, and that, you. That, 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 um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, we, it's a weird one. We're, we're kind of working our way through it. Just to say, um, one thing that's come out of it is having the opportunity to have conversations with people like mm, you. Definitely. Yeah. Which has been awesome. absolutely fantastic. You know, um, uh, yeah, it's that, like you said, to, to take that opportunity, you know, I, I've, con I, I've approached you. Luckily you've said yes. I bought the book. I'm already really enjoying it, and here I am talking to you. And it's it just, you know, that is um, serendipity, really. It's brilliant, brilliant when that happens. So there's some mm. good stuff, you know. Yes, and, it, and it's, it's a reciprocal thing. Uh, yeah, we've, we've all benefited from this. It's been a pleasure well, to meet you both. It's, it's been a fantastic conversation. Um, and we're just going to probably chop in half, Tony, are we? Yeah, I think we. I think we will. It's it's, it's been so much information. Just like uh, just like to add, it was Rod Stewart. I just remembered. Ah, well done. <laughs> we said wish up wish i knew yeah so i think it was yeah, the faces there you go. There you go. but it's been uh again an absolute pleasure talking to you richard i mean uh, i'm sure we could talk all day there's so, so many things we could talk about that we have in yeah. common likewise tony it's been a pleasure to meet and chat with you and i'm admiring your telly behind you there Love yeah you it. like that do you? very much <laughs> good good yeah. <laughs> but for now and hopefully we'll, we'll talk again but it's been Brilliant. Richard Digby Smith, uh, good luck with the book. Uh, one, two, three, four. I've shown it uh, uh, several times. It is a great book. I'm currently loving it. So, um, to people who, who love their music, I, I totally recommend it to you. And thanks very much for your time. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Richard, thanks. Uh, I'm going to end this meeting and try and sn sneak into the end of the last okay. meeting. I keep my job, <laughs> but brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. it's a pleasure. It's been I a told pleasure. You. I told you they have trouble shutting me up once or twice. <laughs> yeah, but in a good way. <laughs>